Well, let's uh, speak to Annalise Dodds now. And uh, Shadow Secretary, uh, first of all, good morning to you. Very nice to see you. It's a big day for you. And before we, we talk about uh, house building and a, a new patriotic economy, uh, can we get your, your thoughts first on MP safety? Yes, of course. Good morning. Well, of course, the, the safety of members of parliament is very important, as indeed of all public actors. And in fact, I think we've talked before about the nature of uh, social media as well. So, you know, I'm certainly very grateful uh, to both the parliamentary authorities and, of course, the police for all the work that they do around this. And I think it's really important that MPs are able to actually have a dialogue with their constituents. That's really important to me. Uh, I also think that protest is very important. Of course, it cannot then become intimidation and threats. And, you know, I think that's where the, uh, where the clear red line is. Speaking of intimidation, um, there are lots of questions about the role that your party leader had last week uh, before a key uh, vote, Opposition Day vote for the SNP. Um, lots of criticisms also of the Speaker of the House, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Um, it's possible that we might see this vote returning at some point. What assurances can you give um, to people watching this morning that we won't see a repeat of those seeds that happened in Parliament last week? Well, I can give you a cast iron in, uh, uh, assurance that there was absolutely no undue pressure at all from the Labour Party around what took place last week. Um, I did certainly share, I think, the public's concern at the scenes that we saw when we saw, of course, lots of MPs walking out of the chamber. I think that was incredibly disappointing because these are really important issues. You know, there's many people in our country who are desperately concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. It is important that Parliament is able to give a view on this. And obviously, last week, Labour tried to build a consensus around that. That was why we set out that motion, which we believed could actually provide consensus around these issues. Unfortunately, however, you know, both the Conservatives and the SNP decided, as they say, to walk out of the chamber. I don't think that was the House of Commons at its best. I don't want to see that kind of thing happening again. And so, you know, obviously, if the issue does come back again to be discussed in Parliament, we again would be seeking consensus. We think it's important that on these issues, foreign policy issues, that we actually have an approach from the UK, which is based on consensus and which enables us to use our role, really, our diplomatic role to its full potential. So talking about diplomatic, um, to, you, you've, you've tweeted out, um, because perhaps because Conservatives still refuse to adopt the definition used by every other major political party in Britain, obviously referring to Lee Anderson here. And your question is, why are senior Conservatives finding it so hard to call out Islamophobia? What, what is this um, uh, definition used by every other major political party? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've, I've actually written to the Conservatives seven times about this. So this is a, a definition of... Islamophobia that was created by the all-party parliamentary group on British Muslims, completely cross-party. So, for example, Baroness Farsi from the Conservative Party, she was heavily involved in producing that definition. It sets out how uh, Islamophobia, uh, sorry, Islamophobia is a form of racism and really indicates how it can actually be tackled. And, you know, whether we're talking about Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, other forms of racism, sexism, you know, all of this is about removing unfair prejudice from our politics. You know, one of the things I'm really proud about with our country is that we can have that democratic debate where everyone is treated the same, where it shouldn't matter what your ethnicity is or your faith is, but we do still see prejudice unfortunately. That's why every party should be taking action on it. And you know, I've been really disappointed that the Conservatives have not grasped the nettle 
when it comes to Islamophobia. So that's why I've been taking it up with them repeatedly. Although, you know, Mark Harper this morning saying the firm and decisive leadership to take away the whip was demonstrated how seriously we take this issue. And the idea that Starmer is, is giving advice on how to take extremists out of the party has to be taken with a pinch of salt, given, you know, the history of the Labour Party and problems with anti-Semitism. And just last week as well, all the incidents in Rochdale with Azhar Ali. So it's a bit rich, isn't it, for Sir Keir Starmer to be giving advice on all of this? Well, actually, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think it's a very clear example of the difference between the parties. Keir Starmer's made it his personal mission to make sure that the Labour Party is rid of anti-Semitism. I've worked with him as party chair over the last few years on this. We've put in place a completely new complaint system. We've totally overhauled our processes and quite rightly too. And that's meant that whenever there has been any indication that any of our members, of our politicians, have been engaged in prejudice-based behaviour. We've immediately acted on it. We haven't hung back. Now, as I said, I've written to the Conservative Party seven times over the last three years. They've not acted on this. And that is a really clear contrast with what's happened with Labour under Keir Starmer. There is a changed Labour Party now under Keir Starmer, but we've not seen that kind of leadership, unfortunately, with Rishi Sunak. And it just seems to be that he's too weak to act on these kinds of issues. Um, Annalise, we're going to hear a lot from Keir Starmer today. And um, unfortunately, we've had a lot to talk to you about as well. But w w he's talking about house building. He's talking about the, the housing problem in this country. But um, he's, he's also going to talk about a patriotic economy. W what does he mean by that? What means an economy where British people have got good jobs, where they've got money in their pocket and where they've got a stake in the economy? And I'm sure that people watching this will appreciate that that simply isn't what people in our country have at the moment. You know, the kind of expectations that people in our country used to have, you know, that their kids would be better off than they were, that they'd have at least a slightly better quality of life. You know, the fact that their kids might be able to get on the housing ladder. You know, all of those dreams are just completely out of reach for very many people in our country. And Keir Starmer is absolutely determined to change that for the future, getting Britain building, actually making sure we have those good jobs up and down the country, reforming the planning system, the many changes that he's setting out today would make that big difference to British people. And, and he's going to be joined by Angela Rayner today. A lot of people would say she hasn't acted in a particularly patriotic way, gaming the system, depriving other families of, of social housing by benefiting from a scheme that she has built her career on criticising. I'm afraid completely the opposite. I couldn't disagree with that more strongly. And I think the facts indicate that very clearly. Look, Angela Rayner has always said that it is absolutely right for people to be able, when they've been council tenants, to have that right to their own home. But Angela Rayner has also been clear that actually the system's changed radically over the years. When Angela purchased her council home, along with many others, that was back in 2007, the discount was 25%. The Conservatives have since changed it to 65% and they've not built the homes that have actually been needed while council homes have been sold off. So There's been a big difference over that period and I think Angela's quite right actually to call this kind of criticism out. There shouldn't be prejudice against people who've lived in council homes and who've bought their own council homes but there should be a system that actually enables people to live in a decent home, whether that's a council home, a social home, a genuinely affordable home, or as owner occupiers. And that's what Labour's determined to deliver. OK, and that's the, uh, the crux of the problem. Folks who want to know your view on all of that, gbviews at gbnews.com, as explained by uh, the Labour Party chair, Annalise Dodds. Thank you very much, Annalise. We're going to leave it there.